Welcome back to our series of videos on domes. In this session we're going to talk about constructing a geodesic geometry based on the spherical icosahedron. As in the past we're going to start using our structural analysis program multi-frame which allows us to do some pretty sophisticated geometric constructions in a really simple way. And if we want to, in the end, it also allows us to analyze the structures that we create. In this case, I'm going to draw a member and I'm going to set one end at the origin. And I'm going to set the other end at X equals one and Y and Z equal to zero. So I have a member of length one. And I'm now going to turn that into a pentagon. And the reason I want to do this is that um, every vertex of the icosahedron has five identical equilateral triangles coming to the vertex. And the base of all those equilateral triangles is a pentagon. And so the pentagon becomes a crucial uh, sort of intermediate contra construct uh, to get to the final answer. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to duplicate it and I'm going to do so cylindrically, not linear, but cylindrical. And I'm going to put in here a spacing of 72 degrees and I'm going to do it four times and I'm going to click OK. And now I'm going to construct my pentagon around that. So this is a regular pentagon with five equal sides. Now when I click on this I get a length of 1.176 and it's actually more digits than that um, but that's all that's displayed here for the moment. But if I hit Control C for copy I copy that number uh, to a large number of significant space is significant figures and now I'm going to hit cancel because I just wanted to get that piece of data off of there so now I'm going to go to a spreadsheet and I'm going to actually scale let me go back a second I'm going to scale this whole thing so an, an edge is unity and we do that just to keep the mathematics simple uh, we don't have to but we're going to do that Eventually, we may scale this so that the radius of the sphere within which this can be inscribed is unity. But we don't know what, that, what the relationship is between an edge and a radius. Uh, it's much easier to start off constructing edges and then figure out what the radius is and then we'll scale it appropriately. We can either scale it in multi-frame or scale it in a spreadsheet. So right now, we have this uh, 1.1 whatever it is and we want to make this edge 1 so we're going to go to a spreadsheet and we're going to just pick a cell and we're going to say equals 1 divided by and then I'm going to paste in that number that I just copied and I'm going to hit return and I end up with this number right here. So that's the scaling factor that I would need to use to apply to what I've created already to assure that my edge is one. So I'm going to click on this cell and I'm going to highlight the cell and I'm going to say copy and when I see those dashed lines going around I know that I have copied that onto my clipboard and now I'm going to go back to a multi-frame. I'm going to lasso all of this and I'm going to go to geometry and I'm going to pick rescale um, in AutoCAD this would be called scale but we're going to rescale and we're going to paste that number in now normally when you get to this each of these factors would be one I'm now substituting in uh, the precise factor that I want to scale everything by and you'll notice I've scaled everything in the X Y and Z direction I didn't really have to mess with Y if I didn't want to because nothing in my drawing so far has any Y dimension anyway. So putting in the scaling factor doesn't really alter anything. But I'm trying to get across the basic point that in this operation, 
uh, we are scaling every dimension. So I'm going to click OK. And now when I click on one of these edges, it's 1.000, and it would be many more zeros out after that. So I've now created my pentagon, um, which is the base. So I'm going to take a top view of this for a moment. And uh, I'm going to observe the following triangle. Here I have an isosceles triangle. This angle right here was 72 degrees by the nature of our construct, which is one fifth of 360 degrees, which is what's necessary to go around here and complete um, the uh, polygon. This angle has to be 54. We take uh, the, all the interior angles of a triangle, sum to 180, 180 minus 72, is 108 and then when we divide that by 2 we get 54 for each of these angles. So um, one of the things I want to do is uh, double click on this member right here and you'll notice I'm getting 0 0.850 something or other. That's the length of that member when we impose upon this the condition that be, this be 1. Now, what we want to do is, if we, if we knew what we were doing, we could do it right now, but I'm not going to do it yet because I want you to follow the construction logic. But we could lift that point up, and when we lift it up high enough that these members get long enough, we can stop when this member and that member and all five of these members have length of one. Now, we could actually do that by trial and error in multi-frame, but we want to be a little more sophisticated than that. So, we're going to do the following. Um, we're going to extrude that point up. And the reason I want to do that is, I'm going to extrude it up y equal to 0.5. And by the way, the reason you see these numbers in here is that I did this earlier as a quick test. so. Normally, this would be 0, 0, 0, just like X and Y and, and Z. And we'd be asked to replace those with whatever we want. In this case, I'm putting in 0.5. And I'm going to zoom in on that a little bit and kind of go around. So basically, I'm going to create my pentagonal pyramid by snapping a, a face there. And so I'm going to do this. This is one of the triangular faces. There are five of them all together. And just for completeness so that you can visualize this, I'm going to put all these in. So now I have a pentagonal pyramid. And when I double click on these members, Remember, they were 0 0.850 something or other down there. And now, when we lift it up, we've gotten to 0 0.986. So my first guess of 0.5 here was pretty close. Um, but I haven't raised this point quite far enough. So here's the logic of what we need to do. We need to figure out what this height is in order to make this one. And we already know what this is because when we double click on it, we could copy that number right there, right out of multi-frame and we'd know that number. We don't know what this is supposed to be, but we know this is supposed to be one. So in this right triangle, the square of this side plus the square of that side should equal the square of that side. That's the Pythagorean theorem and we want this side to become one. So we can turn the Pythagorean theorem around and we can say this squared is equal to that squared minus that squared. So that's what this formula right here is saying. This is the number that we would extract out of um, multi-frame. Or we can calculate it ourselves in a spreadsheet. But if the edge is 1 is unity, and we know the lower side of that triangle is 0.850, and in this case it's 
0.850651. When we run all those out, this is what we get for the height of that triangle. And for the moment, I'm going to come and I'm going to just pull this up and I've redone that formula right here. But I've also worked it out right here. So here it is, the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus that dimension, which is right there. That's the dimension in the um, isosceles triangle in the base of the pentagonal pyramid. So I've used my spreadsheet to get that number and now I'm going to copy that number and I'm going to go back to multi-frame and I'm going to click on this joint and I'm going to plug that in for Y. And now when I double click on these members, I should get 1.000. So that's, I did that. Now the question then becomes, um, can we find the radius of the sphere within which this would be inscribed? And the reason we need to know that is we need to slide this upward then we need to mirror it around the X Z plane. Then we need to rotate the one that we mirrored by 36 degrees. And we, we need to have all those dimensions correct that whatever we produce is inscribed within a sphere. So what we don't know right now is how far up we need to move this. Well, it turns out um, the radius of the sphere will take us from the origin to this tip or any other tip here once we have it in the right position. So we need to move this the radius minus that amount. So if I go back to my spreadsheet, <clears throat> in my spreadsheet I actually did a calculation to figure out um, what the radius is, but and I can I can show you all the mathematics of that but the simpler thing to do really is to go to a CAD program uh, like AutoCAD. So I've constructed it here and you'll notice that I have constructed a circle that goes out to the tip of that and now that has to be the sphere within which everything is inscribed. So I've extended this line out to here and here and that has set this dimension across there then I project up by the height that we just calculated for the pentagonal period pyramid so this would be the base of the pentagonal pyramid and uh, this is the height and now I can use a tool <coughs> basically an AutoCAD and this would be in all manner of other uh, computer programs where I go and I say I want to draw a circle and I want it to be a three point in fact I need to redo that again I want to say circle um, and I don't want that I want Oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. I want an arc. And now I snap to there, snap to there, snap to there. And this, of course, I would need to check again just to make sure. Uh, so then I come along and I say dim. And I want to do radius. And then I click on this. And that gives me the radius. So then I can take that number, which I can display to how, how much accuracy I need. So I can go back to my spreadsheet, and I could put that number right here. Now in my spreadsheet, I already calculated it, so I'll, I'll provide information for you about how you would go about doing that. Uh, and I have the formulas and everything. But for the moment, I'm going to put that number right there. And then I'm going to say, if the zenith point needs to be this far out from the... Um, the origin or the center of the icosahedron and the height of the of the uh, pentagonal pyramid is that 
then the offset for the pyramid base from the center of the icosahedron, or in other words, from the origin of our geometry, is going to be this minus that. So let me make sure I did that. Divided by 2, yes. Um, because we're going to offset the pentagons in both directions. So um, this is that minus that divided by 2, and that's how much I go offset it by. So I'm going to go to multi-frame, and before I left that, I was supposed to copy that. So again, I'm copying this, I'm getting all the accuracy that's involved in the computation, even though it's not displayed to a huge number of thing, uh, significant figures. And now I'm going to lasso all that, and I'm going to go to move, and I'm going to move it in the Y direction by that amount. And now I'm going to mirror this about y and I'm going to duplicate it and it looks like that and then I'm going to take that and I'm going to rotate it about the y-axis 36 degrees and it doesn't matter whether it's negative or positive and now I did that wrong so Yes, I sloughed over that. Let me go back to that. And I don't think this should be over two. It should just be the difference of those two. And I didn't mean to do that. So now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna copy it. And now I'm gonna go back to multi-frame and I'm going to, uh, let's see how many of these I can undo. All right, so I'm going to go back to there, and now I'm going to move that. And now I'm going to mirror that. And just to check, by the way, I'm going to put my pointer on there, and I'm getting 0.951 which is what I expect as a radius from the origin to that tip. So now I'm going to mirror this about Y. I'm going to rotate it 36 degrees about Y. And now I'm ready to construct all these interior triangles. And before I do them all, I'm going to pause and I'm going to click on that and it says 1.0000. So that tells me I've done everything right. So now I'm going to go snap from there to there to there. And make sure I'm getting this right gets a little confusing. I don't know how we ever survived without computer visualizations, but somehow we did. Fortunately, I was smarter in those days and could somehow master all this and figure it out. Okay, so at this point now, I'm at liberty to delete all of that and delete all that which was simply part of the construction. So now we have um, this icosahedron which I'm going to go store somewhere and then I'm going to provide that for you. So I'm going to say um, this is a basic icosahedron with R of 1. Excuse me, edge of 1. Uh, I put edge equals 1, but then Windows would choke on that.
All right, so now we can rotate this icosahedron around. And I'd even like to start giving these members some dimensions so that I can uh, get a little better sense of what's in front of what else. And so the way I do this is I know this thing is really small, so I'm going to go find the smallest structural member that I have, and I'm going to do that. And now that doesn't look too bad. I thought it was going to be a lot worse, but that is the icosahedron. Okay, now, um, for the moment, I'm going to do something else, though. I, I want to choose a member that has a cross-section that has some apparent directionality. And I can actually turn on something in this program that allows me to display axes. So, for example, if I did here, I say, go to Symbols and Section Axes. I'm going to click OK. And now you'll notice in every case, Y is in a vertical plane, the Y axis. Um, so I can always rotate this around and put Y into a vertical axis. And X is sometimes called the strong axis and Y is called the weak axis, but in the case of this little pipe I chose, X and Y are the same thing. So here's, here's a, a really crucial step. Multiframe will allow me to reorient these in a variety of ways. So I'm going to take all these members and I'm going to go to um, Frame and pick Member Orientation. And this orientation, by the way, has to do with the cross-section. So right now it's showing the y-axis up. And, and by the way, this gets a little confusing because there it's x and here it's z prime. And, and I, I can't get into the details of that right now because it has to do with fundamental contradictions between the way the steel manual was really originally set up where this axis for the cross-section was always X uh, and the way that it was logical to do things relative to the nomenclature and axis designations in the computerized software. So we have this problem in every piece of computerized software that it's putting in this X to reference us back to the strong axis in the, as shown in the steel manual but then they become schizophrenic because now they're showing it as, as Y and Z. But we're not too worried about that because right now we want to orient it so that Y is always in a plane going through the origin. And uh, you'll see why that is in, a, in shortly, uh, but I want to be more graphic about it and so rather than make the correction right now, I'm going to do this and I'm, I'm going to go make this entire thing bigger because I want to put some other type of member on it that allows us to visualize the significance of X and Y more. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to pick rescale and I'm going to just, and before I do that, by the way, I'm going to hit save and then I'm gonna go save as and I'm going to make this uh, edge 10 and I'm gonna hit save and now I'm going to rescale everything and I'm gonna put in 10 and now I really have to put in I have to put it in for everything because there are dimensions here in every direction. So now I'm going to hit control total, which means shrink to see it all. And now I'm going to change the members. I'm going to select everything. And instead of these little round pipes, I'm going to go pick a wide flange, go down to the bottom here, take a W4 by 13, 
and now I want to visualize what this looks like. Now you'll notice in this case the the web of every member has been oriented vertically. So the web of that member is vertical, the web of that member is vertical, the web of that one is vertical, and so forth. But in a dome, we would like to have all those web members uh, with their webs going through the origin of this system. And otherwise, we have we'd have wide flanges meeting at odd joints, um, inter intersecting at joints in odd ways that would make it really difficult to develop a joint. So we're going to do the following. We're going to pick all these members. I'm going to turn that off. Select everything. I want to go to member orientation and I'm going to pick advanced because Many of these are rotating by different angles, and I don't even know how to specify the angle, but they have this very powerful tool that I requested quite a while ago that they put in here for advanced, and then I'm going to say we're going to orient to a point, and that point is going to be the origin. So all of these members are going to be where when we draw a line through the web, it arrives at the origin or a line from the origin is parallel to that. So now I'm going to click that and now I'm going to go render this again and you'll see now how every member is sort of pointing itself towards the origin. Now it's really crucial that we do that step at this point because the next step here is to turn this icosahedron into a dome, which means the members need to get subdivided and then they need to reach out and have their endpoints become part of the sphere within which this icosahedron can be inscribed. So I'm going to hit save there and um, keep in mind that. I want, when I arc each of these, I want them to go out directly towards the sphere and I want them to continue to have their webs pointed back towards the origin. And that will happen when I apply the next operation to this. So I'm going to first of all turn that off. I'm going to go to display symbols and I'm going to turn off all these uh, section axes because now they're just kind of visual noise and I'm going to subdivide each of these members so I'm going to save this and now I'm going to save it again as uh, spherical That should have an N in it, by the way. And I'm going to call this four frequency. And I'm going to hit save and then OK. I'm going to select all these members now. I'm going to go to Geometry, Convert Member to Arc, and I'm going to subdivide each of those four times. And I have it on radius, and now I have to find the right radius. So right now it's got some number in there, but I need to go back to my spreadsheet where I wrote down what what in the world happened there. Oh. Ooh, I'm not sure what happened to that. Fortunately, I got all that stuff done. Okay, so this is the radius. 
So I'm going to copy that to get all the information out of it. And I'm going to come back here and I'm going to paste this in. Now, what we're saying basically is we want the same radius of curvature for whatever this sphere is that we're inscribed inside of. Uh, and this should have been, by the way, 9 point whatever. And now you'll notice I made a mistake because everything is uh, arced back towards the inside. So I'm going to undo that and now I'm going to go to my arc function. And now you'll notice right here when this thing oriented the member towards the origin it put the positive y-axis of the member pointing towards the origin and i had that clicked here so when i clicked that it tended to arc it in towards the origin if i want to get it away from there i need to click minus y which merely means it's going to bow in the other direction and now i finally have my icosahedron and you'll notice it seems to be pretty well behaved in that all these arcs are coming together and we, we don't have like a divot there or a point um, so it's pretty clear that we have constructed this appropriately so now i'm going to uh, zoom down here and i'm going to construct some additional members for this uh, thing and I'm going to uh, pick one of these triangles up here so I'm going to go zap 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 and just for the fun of it I'm going to go make these members uh, something different. So instead of uh, W4 by 13, I'm going to go see what's the lightest M section. There is a W4 by 6. So I'm going to hit OK. And now, before I forget, I'm going to do what I said before, which is I'm going to orient these things. So I'm going to go to Frame member orientation pick advanced pick the origin click ok and now i'm going to convert these two arcs and again i'm going to go minus y except now i'm only going to go two and that's how i begin to create a more spherical kind of geometry so just to kind of get the point across, I'm going to do a couple more of these really quickly. Um, and in fact, I think rather than do that, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to click in this one. Okay, so we have one of the triangular faces, and I'm going to go click on this, and you'll notice it says 2.714, and I click on that, and it says that. So this member and that member are identical, and likewise that member. So I think that um, you can go through and get the links off of these things, and you could literally construct now this icosahedron and uh, you can have this file and you can click off of here to get what the lengths of the members are. For the moment, I'm going to just go ahead and deconstruct the following. Each of these, when I click on it, is called a design member. So there are four little segments, but it's assuming you want to see all of those. If you want, you can either take the length of that, which is 
10.493. Now remember our edges, because we scaled up the one unit edge to 10 units, the straight icosahedron edge was 10 feet. Uh, now along this arc, the four members are 10.493. Uh, you can divide that by four on your calculator, or if you want to, you can come along here and you can ungroup. So you remove that design member and now you can click on that. So that member is 2.623, and by the way, all four of these and all four of those and all four of those have that same length. So that's one length. Um, and you'll, you'll go through and click each of those and find not only how long they are, but you can figure out how many there are in your overall dome. Now, the one comment I'll make is that uh, in setting this up, I have made this arc subdivided equally. You can also run this geometry, and it's much more complicated to do this, but you can run this geometry so that that member is equal to that member is equal to that one. And I think that that's the way that uh, Duncan Stewart did this originally, um, but it's been 30 some years since I looked at that, so we'd have to figure it out. So I guess my point is, if you look at this particular geodesic geometry, and then you use one of the pieces of software that you can get offline, uh, or get online rather, and run, you might get slightly different numbers because instead of making all these members the same length, they might have run the geometry to make those members the same length. And, and by the way, one of the great sciences of all of this is to figure out how to make as many members as possible the same length because that just simplifies the fabrication and it simplifies uh, keeping track of the inventory of parts. So um, that's one basic method. So you can click on these, do an inventory in Excel of how many different members. And by the way, when you go around a sphere like this, you're going to discover something interesting. We always said when I was doing geodesic domes that counting is one of the hardest things in the world to do uh, because you're trying to track your way around the surface of a sphere and you're trying to make sure that you count everything once but not more than once. So this will be one of your challenges to double click on these members right into Excel say the length that you get off of it and then uh, <clears throat> subsequently uh, figure out how many of those members you've got now, one of the ways you can also do this is you can take this particular dome and do a 3D printing of it also. The problem, of course, with the 3D printers is that to do, to do anything sizable is uh, pretty expensive. And I'm not sure how many problems you will encounter if you try to do something this delicate as a 3D printing operation. But that would be interesting to see. Um, by the way, I put these members in. I haven't given them a section yet, and I haven't oriented them yet. Uh, but this is what this dome is starting to look like. Okay, so I'm going to uh, reiterate something I said earlier, which is um, these members, the, more, the higher the frequency, the more nearly these members come in flat. Um, the closer they are to flat, the greater the probability that you'll have something called punch-through or uh, pop-through of the joint, um, where suddenly it buckles from being sticking out to sticking inward. So when a dome gets to be a very high frequency, it's not stable with pin joints. An icosahedron is very stable just with pin joints, but we need moment joints at some point. Those moment joints can be made by plate, plates on the top and bottom. We can stamp those plates to give them a little bit of curvature or something to allow them to adapt to the members, which you'll notice are not coming through, coming together at the joint 
in a plane exactly. There's a little point there. And to accommodate that point, we can forge or change the shape of um, a plate. Or we can curve the members, as we mentioned, by running them through rollers or by um, a process called bumping, where we just push on them gently to create some curvature. Um, these members don't have to be very curved between there and there, so we could easily bump them and then we could use flat plates top and bottom for the joints. Now, um, you can either do straight struts here or you can figure out a way to curve these members and I kind of am inclined towards that because then it makes the joints really easy. We just cut some little flat plates top and bottom and glue them on the joints and these members we can cut to the appropriate curvature on the laser cutter. So in terms of mocking something up fairly quickly, um, I would be more inclined to do that than to uh, cut a bunch of struts that are straight and try to figure out a joint that connects them together. So I'm going to uh, do another video which takes off what those curved members would look like in terms of lengths so that you can at least construct the uh, curvilinear spherical icosahedron and then we can talk about whether you want to do something more elaborate than that. So that ends our video on constructing a geodesic geometry based on the spherical icosahedron.